Okay, friends. Gonna start in a second. Okay. Friends! Happy Sunday. Welcome back to Zine Dreams. I'm Jen De La Vega. Stream is an exploration of independent zines and commercial magazines, how they're structured, how they're made, tips for curation, and other ways to express yourself with printed matter. Uh, last time, last Sunday, we looked at Put an Egg on It, issue number 13, uh, Cat Calls, which was a Kickstarter project by my friends Carol and K Pan, and the Black Lives Matter protest handbook that is being distributed at City Hall. Uh, how are you? How is your Sunday going? Mine is pretty good. I deep fried a chicken today. <laughs> Before noon, I deep fried a chicken. That's what my life is like. Um, this week, we are going to look at Put an Egg on It, issue number 14. A really cute zine I found called BTS Aren't That Bad. They aren't that bad. <laughs> and uh, an issue of Culture Magazine, The Word on Cheese. So Culture is a cheese magazine. This is spring 2011, I think. Yeah, volume three, issue two. Cool. Have you all had your brunch or breakfast yet? Yeah, I'm pretty sleepy myself. Sunday is a sleepy day. By the way, if you want a crown next to your name, uh, like Seven Bean Salad, uh, you can subscribe to this channel to send me a little bit of money every week, which is very nice. If you have an Amazon Prime account, you can connect that to your Twitch, and then every month you can support a creator you like, and it changes every month. So you can uh, choose to support me, or you can choose to support any of the organizations I have in my profile, like Baby Castles or Wonderville, or my friend Bijan Steven. Um, there are lots of people you can support on Twitch. Uh, but yeah, that is the, the thing about subscriptions. That is one way we keep streams going and make a living, you know, during a time when I don't really have a lot of work. Uh, below the video here, there are tons and tons of links. Um, if you want to send a tip, there's my Venmo, uh, there's my Patreon, which has lots and lots of material every week now. Uh, follow me on Twitter, you can listen to my podcast, Fun City. I have an Etsy store, there's so much stuff. So check out all the links down there, those are all the ways you can support me. But uh, let's just start talking about some zines, right? So this is, can you hear me all right? Just want to make sure. You can hear me all right. Let's put an egg on me. There you go, put an egg on me. Yay, thank you. Okay. So in the spirit of put an egg on it, we put an egg on me on the, on the stream. Um, cool. So we open it up. And we've got a beautiful grilling, like, photo here. We got a food tip to start it off. Garlic smash. Microplaning or blending garlic will give you a spicier blast than chopping them. The more you break down their cell walls, the more chemicals they release. I think this is when I started contributing the food tips. So there's the garlic smash, garlic hulk. There, he's out angry. I'll read you this letter from the editor. I've never been accused of stinginess when it comes to party throwing. Oh, I haven't seen you in ages, I've been known to say. Please come to my birthday party, wedding, bar mitzvah, summer picnic tomorrow, and please bring your cousins and their neighbors too. Those in relationships with me tend to get a little nervous, but it always works out. Just send someone down to the bodega for some chips and beer to make whatever you're cooking stretch a little bit farther. Inspiration for your own big cookout. Alejandro Osses photo photographs a big family in Paseo de Oya outside of Bogota. Also helpful, a whole bunch of party-friendly goat recipes. Oh yeah, so our recipe theme for this issue is goat. Goat meat. Yeah. We have some photos here. Let's see. An excerpt from Dinners and Luncheons. I'll read you a little bit of this. Gladstone was a marvelous, conver marvelous conversationalist and particularly alive at dinner parties. 
where, by the way, in his more vigorous days, he came rightly near monopolizing the conversation. Does that sound like anybody you know? Two well-known men about town who prided themselves on their ability to be interesting at the dinner table were invariably eclipsed when Gladstone was present. No matter what the subject broached before it had proceeded far, the G.O.M. forged to the front, and by his familiarity with the question became the focus of all eyes and ears. Tired of being thus overshadowed, the gentleman referred to hit upon a plan for getting even, at least for once. Selecting an abstruse and very unfamiliar subject, they delved into the Encyclopedia Britannica and thoroughly posted themselves. The question was one on which scientists differed, and so the conspirators took opposite sides, each prepared to maintain his view. At the convenient moment during their next dinner when they met Mr. Gladstone, the subject was sprung and immediately the two disputants went at it, hammer and tongs. For some time, the fight raged hotly, no one else venturing to take part in the discussion. The trick was working capitally, and the triumphant pair cast congratulating looks at one another. Mr. Gladstone hadn't spoken a word. Finally, the hostess, in a momentary lull in the conflict, said, What are your views about this matter, Mr. Gladstone? Which do you think is right now? There is very little choice, returned the sly old fox, turning with a good-natured smile to the disputants. I made up my mind as to that when I wrote the article on the subject in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which, by the way, gentlemen, I see you've been studying very carefully, there was a moment of embarrassing silence and then a roar. The conspirators acknowledged themselves fairly beaten and since they allow Mr. Gladstone the floor whenever he signifies to wish to occupy it. Whoa. I don't... Uh, this is from Dinners and Luncheons. Published in 1907. Okay, we have a, a food tip. Try this. Making yogurt cheese is crazy easy, or labna, that's what it's called. You can take a flavor profile in any direction. You take some cheesecloth, double it up, and put it in a fine mesh strainer. Place the whole business over a bowl. Pour yogurt into the cloth and let it sit in the refrigerator for at least a few hours. The longer you let it sit, the thicker it gets. When it's done, put it in a bowl and add whatever seasoning you like. Try a squeeze of lemon and some nice olive oil or sea salt and toss in a bunch of scallions or top with any herbs you have on hand and add garlic and black pepper. That is my thumb in the photo. It's <laughs> <sighs> my thumb. Whoa, it got really dark. I'm gonna turn on a light. Uh, we recommend some Kiklos Greek extra virgin olive oil. Mmm. I don't know. I've never had this brand, Kiklos. K-I-K-L-O-S. We also have a co uh, comic. For some reason, I only crave this dish when I'm hungover, and it's, um... It looks like aliens drinking, like, a, a hot pot tiki cocktail of an octopus? I, th I guess it's like commentary on the things that we eat when we're hungover that are ridiculous. We have a munch about section with Greg Bresnitz. I'll read this to you. Greg Bresnitz is the co-founder and host with brother Darren of Snacky Tunes, a food and music podcast on Heritage Radio Network and head of partnerships at the Ace Hotel. Oh, wow. Um takes us through a tour of Chinatown here. I'll read you a paragraph. The first time we had dim sum was when we were nine years old and our mom took us up here to Chinatown. We went to this massive place and they tried to sit us in this little side room where all the other white people were. Our mom was like, absolutely not. Put us in there. Of course, we were like, mom, you're so being so embarrassing. We're so hungry, but I'll never forget it because we were dead center and got all the carts and so much amazing food. Yes. Mmm, yes, Chinatown. Have you ever had a salted nut roll? Pearson's salted nut roll looks like this. A Pearson's salted nut roll is the Midwestern, Midwestern version of a payday. Cream filling, a touch of caramel, and thick outer layer of peanuts. Oh, that sounds good. Hmm. Sounds good. Uh, we also have Pil Susanep. This is a review written by Baldur Helgeson. Pil Susanep. Have you ever seen this? Cool packaging. When I was 12, living in Iceland, I had a paper route. 
The newspaper would give each paper boy four extra copies to sell on the street for 50 cents each. I would usually manage to get rid of all four before the end of my route, so I'd have $2 cash. A hot dog was $2 back then, and my route ended in front of a corner store that sold hot dogs. I would walk in and order a hot dog with ketchup uh, and fried onions. I did this every day for about two weeks until the old man in the store yelled at me, Why don't you order your hot dog like an adult? He made me a hot dog with the works. Ketchup, remoulade, fresh and fried onions, and pistols in it. It felt like the sky had opened. I had been eating hot dogs wrong all my life. The Sultanet by itself is nothing to write home about. It's actually kind of a shitty mustard. <laughs> Dry and boring, but added to the mix of those other condiments, I can't think of anything more perfect. Oh, it's a mustard from Iceland. I do like a payday. Yeah, payday candy bars are pretty good. But I'm very curious about salted nut roll as well. We have a art uh, collective review here or a profile. About Sandwich Club. Sounds like my kind of people. People have a lot of sandwich-related thoughts and enthusiasm, says Shannon Finnegan, when asked about the origins of her Sandwich Club. And indeed, thousands of people have gotten involved in the project since its inception. Finnegan founded the Sandwich Club with fellow artists Sam Handler and Brianne Temel. They collaborate on a Google Doc with the club's many members. In there, you can find types of sandwiches and their recipes, sandwich ideas that have yet to be tried, as well as sandwich musing and fun facts. The recipes really run the gamut from the sandwich that started it all. Ricotta, apple, sardines, anchovies, black pepper on sourdough? Whoa. Fun. Sandwich club. Sandwich-club.org. Mmm. We have a photo profile of Sunhees Farm and Kitchen in Troy, New York. Lovely. Ooh, kimchi! <gasps> Yummy! The Kims grow Korean chives and parsley and garlic on their family's farm, all of which goes into their kimchi. When they work to bring the farm up to commer commercial levels, they source cabbage from another local grower. Mrs. Kim mixes her seasoning paste in a huge bowl and blends it by hand in the kitchen. She prefers to make small batches frequently. The flavor is way better that way. Cool! Love it! We have an essay here by Bradley Summerall called C Clover Grill. I never would have walked into the Clover Grill in New Orleans for the first time in 1991 had I not needed to sober up before driving home. After a night of drinking with drag queens at the Golden Lantern and dancing with goth gutter punks at the Blue Crystal, I needed hash browns, bacon, eggs, and coffee to prepare me for the trance-inducing drive of my 1979 Lincoln Continental through the dark pine forest back to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Wow, the Clover Grill. Sounds fun. Uh, we have a tip here called Beach Barley Bingo. Toast rice, barley, or oats in the dry pan for two to four minutes before adding liquid for deeper flavor. That's true. Yes, the Lincoln Continental is a big car. <laughs> mm. Let's see. We have a piece here by Cecilia Doherty. Called on the go. Friday morning, rush hour. Sat in line on the ferry. Man on the ferry, dressed in business casual, with a liter bottle of coconut water tipping dangerously out of a side of a compartment of his backpack. Mental note to start drinking coconut water for electrolytes. Picking up the number two train at Chambers Street and going up Columbia University, going up to Columbia University, Morningside. There's a man on the train with a complete protein shake bulging out of his jacket pocket, still in the blender, which is at my eye level. I've got a seat. Blue suit. Blue suit, short, neat hair, leather Oxford. A young businessman on his way to a job with 35 grams of protein to back him up. Ah, so it's a piece about uh, seeing people carry foods on the go. I'm, I'm a walker and eater. How about you? When I, when I was like commuting, I would, I would uh, take that 10-minute walk on the way to the subway and eat my breakfast. Like, I, I don't know. Some people don't like walking and eating, but I find it very efficient. We have a dinner conversation feature with Matthias Wiegener, Cami Staros, and Anne Magnuson. I'll read you the introduction. You can't eat and move at the same time? Come on, really? Too much, too much focus? I spent the afternoon alone in Alexandra's 
and Alexander Lowe's Spanish Mediterranean style Los Feliz house cooking and listening to music and feeling the breeze and the warm sun from the open window. I had pickled shrimp pickling in the fridge and eggplants in the oven basted in shermula and cilantro yogurt sauce, waiting for, waiting for them all on the counter. Oh, and a serious cheese plate, of course. Alexandra works as an architect and interior designer in New York and Los Angeles. Her house is summery and elegant, perfect for this New Yorker coming fresh off a long winter. Anne Magnuson was the first guest to arrive. She is gorgeous and I'm thrilled to meet her. Anne is a musician, actress, and artist. I was a fan initially because of her awesome band, Bong Water, and her column in Paper Magazine, and went on to discover her many performances and films. Matthias Wiegener came by next. He is an artist, founder of the collective Fallen Fruit, and teacher at Cal Arts. Cami Staros is our third guest, and her sculptural work is very smart and alluring. We got to know each other, as you do, by chatting in the kitchen while I finish the appetizers. Yeah... Lovely. Uh, we have a big feature here by Bruce Benderson called Hosting. I'll read you the beginning. In this country, rules surrounding hosting lack stringency. If this were ancient Japan, an untold number of etiquettes for hosting guests would be codified. I'd know how to serve beverages holding my arm at a certain angle or incline my head for small talk. Over here, too many transactions are confined to the nuclear family. Hosting and guesting for those outside it may be highly improv improvisational. I have consequently endeavored to detail my own host-guest etiquette. Maybe it will overlap with your Welton Schwang. Welton Schwang. I think that's a word for uh, hosting and etiquette. etiquette. We have um, a comic by Joan John Broadley's Culinary Cameos. Pip, wandering through the mist, carrying somebody else's pork pie. Great expectations. Look at this style. Cool. Got a few comics here. Wow, look at this. When food steals the limelight in movies. Oh, so it's like fake... Um, What's it called? Movie posters? Uh, Durward Carby Burger and Douglas Skirt Cirque Steak at Jack's Rabbit Slims in Pulp Fiction. Oh, yeah. That's iconic, right? Yeah. Hi, Matt. Good morning. Love this older style. It's a shame you don't see it more often these days. True, true, true. Mm-hmm. Cool Hand Luke, Frenzy. Uh, we got an essay from my friend Kimberly Shu. It's called Bad Hombres. I want to write, I wanted to write a multi-part essay about exes and things we ate together. An essay with some parts longer, some parts short, some more atmospheric, some more narrative, other parts simply recipes maybe. And then yesterday evening, standing in front of a table of staff picks at a local bookstore, I read backwards, page by page, one of the final scenes in another country, James Baldwin's great New York novel set between Harlem and Greenwich Village in the 1950s. In two of the novel's lovers, Vivaldo and Ida, unspool a secret over the course of a dinner that is cooked and consumed in fits and starts, made of whatever is in the icebox. There's rice, pork chops, a salad. As their conversation builds, Ida cooks rice and just before it's done, dumps it into a colander in the sink. At one point, deeper into the night, Vivaldo wolfs down now cold pork chop with milk that in his emotional state feels as if it's curdling at that instant in his belly. Wow. Wow. We have a tip called Ice Manchego. The colder a block of cheese is, the easier it is to grate. If it starts bunching up, stick it in the freezer for five minutes to cool it down. We have an essay here from Anx, Anix, 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 J Bird. All right, anyway, first paragraph. Like many Californians, when I first moved to New Orleans, I thought it had nothing to offer but racism, sexism, misogyny, and extremely easy yet corrupt school system and a lot of red meat. I had the common misconception that you cannot eat a good and be a vegetarian. You cannot eat well and be a vegetarian at the same time. 
Every time I told people I was vegetarian, they'd ask me what I'd eat as if I'd, I was a bunny that only eats leaves. In a place steeped in sausage and gravy, I was sure I wouldn't find the food that satisfied my particular taste. I was 13 years old and very much so completely over New Orleans. And uh, they go on <laughs> to say, you know, how they found their food in New Orleans, which is great. Uh, we got a photo spread from Paseo de Oya Vieta by Alejandro Oces. So this is outside of Bogota. Wow, I love these photos. They're like real filmy, you can tell. Colombians enjoy a get-together called Paseo de Oya, where the whole family is invited to relax by a river and make a stew of hen, corn, yuca, and plantains ah, over a fire. Hagao, a sofrito-like sauce of tomato and onion, is served with it. This afternoon included a baptism took place in Vieta, Cundinamarca, outside of Bogota. Wow. Beautiful. I want to make a stew by a lake. No baptism, though. Cool. Look at everybody enjoying. This is fun. Now we bring us to our recipe section, which is all goat meat. Um, we have a goat breast from my friend Justin Warner. Look at this goat yelling. Ah. <laughs> Uh, I, I submitted a recipe for kambing dumplings. Kambing is Tagalog for goat. Uh, we have wood ear mushroom and goat ashwarma dipping sauce with cold succumen noodles from my friend Rose Lawrence. We have goat milk lattes from Nadine Schaefer. Goat cheese cake with lavender and blueberries from Jen Juanes. Cajeta from our friend Nakshi Gastiola who is founder of Gili Lab. Goat head pate from Tunde Way. Goat cheese garlic spread by Elizabeth Pruitt. Raw goat and smoked oil from Lee DeRossier. Holy crap, scary, awesome. That's why it's awesome though. I mean, that's why we featured goat, right? Because it is a scary thing. And um, I feel like we eat too much beef, you know, and pork. Gotta, gotta get the goat in there, it's pretty affordable good if you know how to cook it and good if you know where it comes from right matt says i used to t my folks used to take me out fishing and camping i don't miss the fishing and camping but I always have a bunch of our extended family with us make a big pot like out, out of it and makes us miss them a lot oh yeah that sounds fun my family went camping too not fishing though i've never really gone well i've gone fishing a couple times but not with my family um, so we have a piece here from called Caleb Reviews, and it's uh, a young a young kid, maybe ten, maybe ten years old, uh, giving a restaurant review of N Seven in New Orleans. <laughs> Fun. And then our back cover here is a comic by Greg Kletzel. That was Put Egg on It, issue 14. These are still on sale in our store at putteggonit.com. Oh, I forgot to say, I have something to show you. We also have these really adorable hats in our store. Um, it is 30 bucks, but we only made 10 of these, and it comes with the latest issue of Put Egg on It, which is over 100 pages. We haven't gotten yet to that issue, which is in probably two weeks, but uh, we'll go through it. But this is an adorable hat. I love it. Yeah. Okay, next. Next is a fun one. Uh, Martin and I found this one at uh, the San Francisco Zine Fest, the last zine festival that I went to. There was this teacher who uh, had a table at the zine fest and was selling copies of the students' zines that they made in, in class. So it was like a fourth grade class, and I thought that was such a fun idea, and they were raising money for the class, you know. Um, teachers shouldn't have to fundraise on their own for school supplies, FYI, but uh, it was a cool way to introduce the kids to zines, but also generate a little bit of money. Um, this one is called BTS Aren't That Bad. Ah, 
Crystal, you love it. Um, you can still see at the top that she had ripped it and not used scissors. So it has this very uneven, um, fuzzy texture. And uh, you can see that it was a long piece of paper. So there's no, uh, no binding, it's just folded. We had another smaller zine last week with an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. This is a legal size. But BTS aren't that bad. Uh, I think it's Kathy, but it, her name is cut off, so I don't know. Kathy, you did a great job. So of course, it's, it's just a pen uh, on, on paper and then photocopied and then assembled. I'll read you some excerpts from it because it's adorable. And I'm learning a lot from it because I am not very familiar with BTS myself. I've met a lot of people that say BTS sucks. Don't know why people even like them. Have they ever met a person that likes BTS? I'm over here like, I know tons of people that like them. This will be a simple guide about BTS. Smiley face. <laughs> Isn't that great? So, BTS is a Korean band made up of seven Korean men. Four vocals. Jin, Jimin, V, Jungkook, and three rappers, RM, Suga, and J-Hope. Jungkook is the youngest and Jin is the oldest. <laughs> they do have real names, they are just their stage names. <laughs> so they have a key for the real name. So RM is Kim Namjoon, Jin is Kim Seok Jin, Suga is Min Yoongi, J Hope is Jun Jun Ho Seok, uh, Park Ji Min, Kim Ta Young, Jeon Jung Kook. So, yeah, there's a key. It's very cute. The order is also the fan chant that the army uses at the concert. Wow, BTS Army is like coordinated. This is adorable. Many fans will have a bias. A bias is the person in a group that they like the most. Your favorite, you know. There's also a bio wrecker, bias wrecker, and that's the second person you like the most. BTS fans are called ARMY or Adorable Representative MC for Youth. I didn't know ARMY was an acronym. <laughs> Adorable Representative MC for Youth. What? I'm learning so much about BTS. BTS worked very hard to reach where they are now, so let's start from the beginning. Okay, BTS stands for Bang Tan Son Yeon Dan, or Bulletproof Boy Scouts. Weren't the B fans of BTS one of the loudest voices shutting down racist stuff when the protest started? Yes. Um, whenever uh, like a racist hashtag would trend on Twitter, the BTS ARMY would share fan cams or video montages of the band to take up the hashtag. So, uh, you know, they're doing two things. They're exposing more people to BTS and then flooding the racist content out. And the BTS ARMY, or, you know, I would say the younger generation, were smart about um, the latest Trump rally where, yeah, it was really amazing. Like, such strategy. Um, from the young generation. Um, so yeah, so during that last big Trump rally, you had to register online for tickets. And um, so all of these fans, all of these BTS fans, registered for tickets to inflate the numbers of, yeah. And then the, the tickets got used up, and then the stands looked barren. Yeah, that was insane. Smart. Um, so they have this like crazy, like you can see just from this kid, this fourth grader sharing all of this information about BTS shows like how organized their community is, which I think a lot of us can learn from as far as disseminating information, like chants, nicknames, protocol, like it's really fascinating. Wow. So BTS is Bulletproof Boy Scouts in Korean. Bang Tan Son Yeon Dan. This is adorable. Um, 
BTS may be very serious on stage. They're all extremely funny people off stage. They make so many memes. And I think that's kind of what makes them so relatable. Um, it's because they make so many memes and that's... They are the source of them and they participate, it, it, participate in it themselves. They, on YouTube, they have a series of short videos called Bong Tan Bomb. Uh, and they show what they're doing off stage, and most of them are really funny. Also, like, behind the scenes. Get it? BTS behind the scenes, right? Uh, cute. In my opinion, all K-pop groups are good. <laughs> this kid is, like, pro... Pro, pro BTS, pro K-pop propaganda. Maybe you will like, maybe you will start liking other ones like NCT, GOT7, Stray Kids, Red Velvet, Blackpink, and there are so many more. I've heard of Blackpink. I'm not fully <laughs> out of it. Yeah, Bulletproof Boy Scouts is kind of an awesome name for a band. I agree. This is so cute. Oh, I'm at the end already. I hope you enjoyed, and you should now go watch some K-pop or BTS funny moments to start with. Thank you for reading. And then she doodled these, these little icons at the bottom. <laughs> Martin says, in fourth grade, I was just barely aware of any bands at all. Good morning, Lucius. Nice to see ya. We were just looking at a zine called BTS Aren't That Bad. Wow, this is very enlightening from a fourth grader. Like, wow. Very, very enlightening. Oops, I'm sorry. I had to take a little bit of a break. Uh, I have something in the oven. So you sit tight for just one second. Sorry about Sorry about that. I'm making homemade spam. <laughs> it's one of the recipes that I'm testing for work. And uh, I'll show it to you once it's cooled down. But, uh, okay, we're going to go to our last magazine, which is from Culture. Uh, Matt says, I think around fourth grade I was listening to Linkin Park. Hybrid Theory was the first album I ever bought. It was great. Can't find my copy anymore, even if I could pretty much sure it would be completely unusable. Listen to it that much. Haha! <laughs> oh, Lucius, what are you having for lunch? Um, in fourth grade, I had this really amazing teacher, Mrs. Alcorn, and she was all about um, naturalists, and like, she took us to Audubon Canyon Ranch as like a field trip, and I like, we learned about newts and salamanders, and I threw a javelin for the first time, like, modeling the local Native American practices, like, that's what I was doing in fourth grade. I was really, really academic in fourth grade. I was reading so much. I wasn't really into music yet. I didn't I get into music until fifth, fifth sixth grade-ish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty, I was a pretty big nerd. I don't know if you could tell. Ooh, leftovers, roast chicken, shallot, potato, tomato, peaches are in season and you have some nice. I have a nectarine in the fridge that I'm very excited to eat. You were, you were reading a lot of books in the Aliens universe, Martin? Oh my gosh. Silly. I was reading a lot of like um, Donald J. Sobel, which is the author of Encyclopedia Brown. Do you remember that series? Well, Encyclopedia Brown is like a little too easy, um, so he had all these other more adult, like, quick mysteries. He had this one compilation called Two Minute Mysteries, 
So it'd be like two or three pages and you'd have to try to figure out like, you know, uh, what went wrong. Yeah, Encyclopedia Brown. Yeah. Sobol is a great um, mystery writer. <laughs> Your first album you bought was R.A.M.'s Green you bought on cassette. Wow. My first album that I bought in fifth grade was Ace of Bass. The sign. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a separate stream about music sometime. I feel like so many of my friends want to talk about music. Yours was They Might Be Giants Flood. Oh, wow. They Might Be Giants. Okay, we're going to look at Culture Magazine. So this is partially relevant to something that happened earlier this week. Um, and it's not that I'm being more call out cancel culture about things. I have been calling out. It's just I've been really silent about it. Like a lot of the media transgressions that have happened, I've always just shared privately with friends and I've never like had the courage to call people out on stuff. But, um, you know. This week, uh, Culture Magazine, which is a cheese magazine that I love, uh, and I've written some recipes for them. Uh, this week, they posted on Instagram a link to a profile about Allison Roman, and I, I was the first person to comment, and I go, I'm sorry, what? And I screenshot it, and um, people started liking my comment. You know, without really arguing or calling them out more, I just sort of was like, why are you featuring Allison Roman? <laughs> like, she did some really horrible stuff. Like, and I shared that to Twitter, and my friends were like, whoa, so being canceled doesn't mean anything. Um, like, ca being canceled is basically a four week vacation. Um, she still gets to like get paid, get spotlight when other people could be helped right now. There are so many people of color in the cheese industry that uh, it just stung even more to see Allison Roman float back up to the top when she really doesn't deserve the time or space anymore. Or, you know, she hasn't really done anything to reflect or like ameliorate the situation. Like, a couple weeks ago, she went on Instagram Live with Ziwei, who is someone that has been um, recording a lot of uh, interviews with white people uh, and really pointing out and unearthing their biases. Like, she asked Allison Roman to name five black people that she knew, and all she could say were celebrities. Uh, this was happening live on the internet, and it was really embarrassing. <laughs> And then she said, can you name five Asian people? And Alison Roman couldn't do it. It was really, really embarrassing. And so I don't know why we keep giving her spotlight. And so I, I called out Culture Magazine about it. And, and they said they removed the post. They deleted it. Um, thank you for doing that. But their excuse was that... This interview was conducted before we knew what Allison did. And this was unacceptable to me because right now is, is July. Her blow up happened in May. So that means this profile about her in this magazine was sitting in a queue waiting to be published since before May. And no one thought to pull it. So I, I told them like, I respect what you do, I love your magazine, I love your work, but, you know, this requires a more stringent, like, examination of your editorial practice, and they were like, yes, absolutely, we're not here to make excuses, even though they did, still respect, you know, whatever, um, and they sent me the email of their new editor-in-chief, because my friend was the editor-in-chief who, who actually conducted the interview way back before any of this happened. Um, and so I understand that Susan just walked into this role and could not have known like everything, but it's a team, you know? It's really hard to work in the food industry and not know about stuff like that. And so you can't really play dumb. You're not doing enough vigilance uh, about your own work. So that's what happened this week. And that's why I'm going to look through a culture magazine. Um, also, to just to show how great it is. 
Um, yeah, we all make mistakes. Yeah, I, I don't hate them. It's just an unfortunate mistake that I caught. I've never been the person fast enough or smart enough to screenshot something like that, and I, I'm glad I did. But anyway, so culture, the word on cheese. This is very exciting. I love cheese. I don't know about y'all. Y'all have a favorite cheese? Tell me your favorite cheese. That's like the worst question to ask me. Like, I, I don't really have a favorite cheese. I have, you know, cheeses that go with things that I like to eat regularly, but I don't really have a favorite cheese. It's hard to ask me. Gouda. Matt says Gouda. What kind of Gouda, Matt? There's so many different kinds of Gouda. So, like, there's aged by year or by month. There's flavor ones. Do you like the hard flinty stuff or do you like the chewy stuff with the wax? Oh, Lucius, you like Grana Padano. Okay, nice. Oh my god, Matt. <laughs> Matt's like, there are multiple kinds of Gouda? Yeah, yeah, dog. So many kinds of Gouda. There are ones that are aged um, for like three years that are like real flinty and taste like caramel. Yeah, smoked Gouda is great. That is one that I grew up with. Yeah. I always, well, Lucius, I mean, I live smoked Gouda. <laughs> oh, okay, Martin's into the Swiss cheeses. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. I get that, Matt. I get it. Totally. I get it. There's still lots of really great things you can do to Gouda, though, too. You know, you can, like, melt it, you can smoke it, you can grate it. Lovely. Okay. Let's get to this. From the editor. Let's, let's read this editor. Elaine Kosrova, editor, letter from the editor. I'm not going to read all of this. It's a very long letter. The English language is said to have the richest vocabulary in the world, yet I'm beginning to think that it's pretty limited in ways to describe cheese. Oh, true. Look at the text in any taxonomy of cheese, and the same words keep coming up. Creamy, tangy, rich, etc. Um, I wish I had a dollar for every time nutty appears. These descriptions are too general. As the ancient Greeks had multiple names for love, we could certainly do well with a few more terms to convey the nuances of cheese character, or at least a few more apt analogies. I was reminded of this recently when my daughter announced one evening at dinner, goat cheese tastes like dirt to me. Um, sitting down to a quick meal, both of us sharing a frittata I made with some very nice aged Vermont cheese, uh, my six-year-old took another bite and said, but not in a bad way. I guess I don't really know what dirt tastes like. I've never eaten any. <laughs> this is a bad breath cheese, but I like it. <laughs> oh, that's fun. More ways to, yeah, des describe cheese. Yeah, earthy. Earthy is the right is the right one. Yeah, Lucius, I know. It doesn't retain the title afterwards, so it's just better if I change it after after the stream. It's so weird. It doesn't stick. But, we'll just leave, okay, here. Uh, did you know, did you know how photography and Thomas Edison led to the invention of cheese paper? Did you know that, well, first of all, let's back up. Like, did you know that there's a specific paper for wrapping cheese? It's not just straight up parchment paper. It actually has um, a layer of plastic on the inside of it so that it helps the cheese breathe. Um, pure plastic wrap on cheese uh, kind of suffocates it. Because if it has active mold cultures in it, it is um, still technically respirating. And so it can sweat and then produce different kinds of mold that you don't want in your cheese. Did you know I love cheese? Did you know, my friend? Um, we all appreciate how a good cheesemonger protects our cheese purchase by carefully wrapping each wedge or wheel in a custom-made cheese paper wrapping it in neat origami-like folds. Few people, however, know the curious story of how this unique layered wrapping paper became a must-have cheese accessory. For centuries, cheese were dipped in wax or wrapped in linen or leaves to protect them from the elements. This, for example, is the Gouda is, is wrapped in wax. Um, yeah. Uh, la, 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 la. This worked well until the cheese was cut open. Then problems began with dryness, cracking, and unwanted molds. 
something better was needed. The ideal wrapping would block light and preserve proper moisture barrier, yet allow the cheese to breathe, like I said earlier. The first step toward making this idealized covering, a waxed paper, actually happened in a French darkroom. In 1851, photographer Gustave Le Gray discovered how to make better negatives by creating a pre-waxed paper film. Being French, he of course loved cheese, but history reveals that his discovery never left the camera. It was not until 1890 when Thomas Edison rediscovered Le Gray's waxed paper film that its potential was realized. Edison was trying to develop a working movie camera and found that he couldn't get the lightweight paper film to move intact through the metal gears of his new motion picture camera. Of course, being Edison, he had a solution. Why not widen Le Gray's thicker wax film and see if it would work? In the process of widening the wax film, Edison quickly saw another opportunity. Remove the photography chemicals and create a new wrapping for food. Initially, Edison's new paper was not poor enough, porous enough to allow the cheese to breathe. But cheese vendors in France eventually solved the problem, and the resulting two-ply waxed paper became Europe's favorite way to protect a cheese. The story com comes back to the States in 2005 when Mark Goldman, an American working for a cheese distributor, saw a niche for cheese consumers. He traveled extensively in France and was impressed with the custom paper he saw at every little shop. Now his company, Formaticum USA, sells imported French cheese paper for retail. Oh yeah, I've used Formaticum. Yeah, I actually really love Formaticum. I just wish that I could afford having cheese paper all the time. It is, you know, more expensive than parchment. Uh, there's some letters to the editor. New on the market. This is fun. New Wisconsin blue cheddar handcrafted in micro batches by Seymour Dairy. Weinlisse, whose name means vintage in German, is the result of a partnership between Wisconsin-based dairy and Red Barn Family Farm. I've been to Red Barn. Um, what happens when two cheesemakers, both named Jeff, collaborate on one artisan cheese? They name it after themselves, of course. Jeff select Gouda. This is from Monroe, Wisconsin. Well, so funny. Um, Maple Brook Farm in Bennington, Vermont, has joined the handful of American dairies produ producing burrata. Mmm, burrata. How many of you have burrata? It's a mozzarella that is stuffed with stracciatella, which is um, ripped up mozzarella pieces that have been soaking in cream and butter. And then we have another cheese. Rogue Creamery in Central Point, Oregon, has introduced Florinella, a uh, new blue cheese from co-owners David Grummels and Carrie Bryant. I've had two of these cheeses. This was in, you know, when, 2011 or whatever? World champion cheese. Yeah, you've had burrata on pizza? Yeah, it's very good. Cornish Blue, crafted by Britain's Cornish Cheese Company, earned the title of world champion cheese at the 2000 World Cheese Awards. Hosted at the BBC Good Food Show in November. Um, this year, the, w the world's best cheese is actually from the U.S. It's Rogue River Creamery, uh, or Rogue Creamery, excuse me, not Rogue River. Rogue Creamery's, um, I'm blanking on the name, Rogue River Blue. It's very, very good. I don't know if you've ever had it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it, and I used to not love blue cheeses, but this one is so good. Uh, Rogue, not like the beer company. That, they might be related, but the cheese company operates separately. I don't think they're related. Best mature traditional cheddar, J-A-N-E Montgomery. Oh, Montgomery cheddar is so good. Best new cheese, pa Paski Sir, Serrana Glori Gorgoa, Croatia. Ooh, a Croatian cheese? I didn't know that. Best USC, USA cheese, Tarantaz from Springbrook Farm in Vermont. I've had that. Best South African cheese, Huigano. I didn't know there was South African cheese. Best continental cheese, Gruyere Premier Cru. Best PDO blue cheese, uh, Gorgonzola. Best Spanish cheese, Spanish cheese, Lo Pebrat de Osera. A breast, best, <laughs> this is a breast. <laughs> best French cheese, Brebi. Uh, best Italian cheese, Rossini, and best Irish cheese, uh, Newmarket Creamery Vintage Dredge Cheddar. It's really interesting the way they divide this. Like, why did they pull out Irish and South Africa out of all the other countries? 
Um, there's this blog called putting weird things in coffee dot com and a reader from North Carolina says I'm from rural eastern North Carolina and my family has been having cheese and coffee as a treat as long as I remember it should be made with hoop cheese or rat cheese a medium cheddar that is never refrigerated wow you put large chunks and pour a strong very hot coffee over it let it steep and then serve the melted cheese over two pieces of bread and you don't really drink the coffee it seems very wasteful Beauty and the Beast. Pliny the Elder claimed that bathing in donkey's milk smooth wrinkles and whitened the complexion. Uh, noted that Pope Popeia, wife of Nero, maintained a herd of 500 asses to supply her with milk. Cleopatra of Egypt and Napoleon's sister Pauline were also given donkey milk fans. Oh, we're also donkey milk fans. Given the latest news from cosmetologists, these legendary ladies were onto something. Donkey's milk, it turns out, contains high amounts of ceramides and phospholipids, two fatty substances found in a cell's membrane that help the cell look more plump, hence less wrinkled or saggy. The bad news, since donkeys produce far less milk than cows, their milk is rare and expensive. Nevertheless, a Swiss company has created a line of anti-aging donkey's milk skin products claiming its precious ingredient is an elixir. Be prepared for more of the same. Kaliness is the name. Ask milk joke. Ass milk. Ass milk. <laughs> Better than breast milk cheese for sure. Yes. That's so funny. Okay, for the birds. While birds are not able to digest milk, it gives them a stomach ache. Fermented milk in the form of cheese is another matter. Some birds, such as robins and wrens, love the stuff. Wow. Uh, Hema Rogers of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds says, I don't think they mind, though it's probably best if it's a mild flavored cheese. The important thing is that it's grated or torn into small pieces because the birds are feeding their chicks at this time of year. They would struggle to swallow large chunks of cheese weird good cheese bad guy oh my pizza slice fell stinking bishop cheese isn't named for its odor its rind is washed with a fruit cider made from a pear variety called stinking bishop the pear doesn't smell either it was posthumously named for the breeder of this specific fruit an ill-tempered man named mr bishop According to Charles Martrell, the English baker, maker of stinking Bishop cheese, Bishop was so ornery that he once shot his tea kettle for not heating up fast enough. Sounds like an angry man. Oh, there's a poem. Swiss cheese. I never thought the moon looked like Swiss cheese. From Pennsylvania, it's merely a cloudy marble brushed with blue. But if I ever saw a moon sandwiched between rye and honey baked ham, I would spread sunny yellow mustard atop and give you a taste of my universe. Whoa, sexy cheese. Uh, there's a book here called Swiss Cheese from Slow Food Switzerland for $95. Whoa. There's book reviews here. There's events. Oh, I miss. Miss cheese events. I go to a lot of cheese events. Oh, here. Here's a big feature here. All grown up. Savor the pleasures of maturity with aged goat cheeses. And so they profile a few here. Oja Santa from the Mozzarella Company in Dallas. Um, Oja Santa is uh, an herb from Latin America. It's very close to mint. But it looks like a shiso, you know, it's like a, a flat, wide leaf. Um, an aged goat cheese cloaked in soft, dark leaves, Oja Santa was created by Paula Lambert. Her inspiration for the cheese came from Patricia Quintana, a chef in Mexico City. Yeah, so the vegetation is native to Veracruz and Oaxaca for wrapping fish and chicken before steaming them. Yum. Uh, we also have Coco Cardona from Car Valley Cheese. It's a Wisconsin chocolate rubbed goat cheese. And we have a classic blue log from Westfield Farm. I actually haven't had that one yet. Yeah. Fantastic Voyage, how a journey from Europe to Asia led to a new brew. And this is kind of a history of IPAs. 
and some brands of IPA to try, like Bellhaven Twisted Thistle, Fuller's India Pale Ale, and Keen's Cheddar, uh, Meantime India Pale Ale, and Stitchelton. So these are cheese pairings with the beer. In the late 1700s, brewing was a big business in England. As British colonists traveled throughout the world, breweries were charged with the task of providing the comforting flavors of hometown ales to countrymen thousand, thousands of miles away. The problem, of course, was that the road from brewery to consumer was a long and arduous one. Cool. Yeah, I agree. Gruyere is a good cheese, a good Swiss cheese. Ooh, there's a guide here for making paneer. Did you know all you need for making your own cheese at home is vinegar and milk and a cheesecloth and a strainer? Pretty much. You can make paneer, you can make ricotta, you can make farmer cheese. You just Google those recipes. Great. Um, Santa Fe feature, goat cheese and chili. Oh, that sounds great. Um, travel, travel, travel. Lots of white people in this. I mean, the American cheese community is very white. <laughs> uh, here's a <clears throat> feature on Allison Hooper, the award-winning cheesemaker and co-founder of Vermont Butter and Cheese. Vermont Butter and Cheese is one of my favorite, favorite goat cheese brands. Um, she was also the president of the American Cheese Society from 2008, 2005 to 2008. A lot of um, cheese culture, a lot of their, a lot of people who have come up in the cheese industry have had sort of this privilege of being able to go to Europe and spend months there to like go, uh, you know, go learn how to make cheese from this auntie out in the middle of the country. Like, I could never afford to do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have those kinds of opportunities. But Vermont butter and cheese is a very good, very, very good cheese. Move over Membrio. Fruit wines bring a light, bright alternative to cheese pairings. We got this feature here. I kind of love this, that there's photog photography and then like modified by light, light illustration or graphic elements. You can see there's like a little outline on the pomegranate and the blueberries. Mm. Pacific Rim Framboise. Ooh, pair that with Briot Sovereign, St. Andre, or Strong Blues like Rogue rogue creameries caveman Ooh, all these dessert wines sound so good i don't like things that are too too sweet i don't like madeiras but um blueberry wine sounds fun pear cider sounds fun apple ice wine sounds really good Ooh. bird in hand chicken recipes with cheese intervention i like that cheese intervention Chicken cacciatore with some aged ricotta. Yum. Tarragon chicken melts. <coughs> so it's like a chicken salad with tarragon and celery and then tomatoes and some cheese broiled over top. Tamale pot pie sounds real good. Mm-hmm. Chicken roulades with goat cheese, dates, and prosciutto. Like the little pinwheels. Sweet and sassy. Once teamed up with meat, Italian fruit mustard or mustarda are now playing the cheese field. Wow, very relevant to what I've been uh, making lately. I made a strawberry mustarda. Here's some of Paola's favorites and her suggested cheese pairings. Uh, yeah. Mustard oil, with its antibacterial properties, added extra protection and sharp pungency that cut the richness, richness of fatty foods. Makes sense. Mmm, green tomato mustarda, plum mustarda, mixed fruit mustarda, white watermelon, paired with robiola, brie, or taleggio, uh, blue cheeses with the orange mustarda, firm cheeses like grana padano with the, the plum mustarda. Next time you have your Grana Padano, try it with some plum mostarda. Or just plums and mustard. <laughs> Actually, separate it. Sounds good. Look at this. I like this spread. I'd like to eat all that. Very curious. <coughs> There's a guide for turning um, a mini fridge into your own 
cheese aging cave. Turn a used appliance into your own cheese aging cave. Because cheese um, requires certain environments to age properly. Like if you took a fresh log of goat cheese, if it had the right humidity and the right temperature, you could turn it into a beautiful like white mold croton or like a brie. So I used to work at a cheese cave, so that's why I know that. <laughs> but hacks, I got DIY hacks in here. Is that fun? Role play. Find cheese as a vital part in Chef Jonathan Sawyer's cooking. And there's a feature on this guy, Jonathan Sawyer. Stinky cheese omelet with herb topping. Oh yeah, I love a stinky cheese. Oh yeah. Sawyer frequently changes the cheese in his menu, but of but of epois, he enthuses. I love you, my fave fave favorite cheese. Alternatives for stinky cheese: Petit Monster, Roblochon, or domestic wash rind cheese as like uh, Meadow Creek Dairy's Grayson. Yum. Oh, you made a strawberry syrup last week. Maybe you'll pair it with your Grana Padano. Yeah, just a little bit. Ooh, house made fromage blanc on grilled bread. Oh, that sounds so good. Raw milk, heavy cream, sea salt, and large artichoke. Oh, artichoke in the cheese? Whoa. Flavor behavior. Cheese makers mix it up with spices and seasonings. Marika Gouda with fenugreek. Oh, wow. Pecorino with pistachio. Braided string cheese with black caraway seeds. Ooh, there's one called Pond Hopper. It has cascade hops and beer inside the cheese. These are fun. Ooh, ro Rochefort with Wasant seaweed. Wow. A lemon, a candied lemon peel inside of a cheese. Uh, Cahill's Plain Porter Cheese. This one looks really cool. I've actually had that before. It's got like a porter beer like laced through it. Crazy. Oh yeah, look at this spread. There's so much cheese here. Oh yeah. This magazine is very thick. Like it's kind of heavy in my hands. Like there's a lot of pages. Um, so it goes on to explain all those cheeses. We have a feature here called Out of the Blue. Swiss cheesemaker Christoph Raz breaks tradition with blue, Blaus Wunder. Mention the color blue to cheese buffs and they'll invariably think of red French Roquefort and Blue d'Auvergne or Italian Gorgonzola and the Brits Stilton or a Swiss blue. No, but a Swiss blue? No way. Ah, so it's like the first time a Swiss cheesemaker is making blue cheese. Because Swiss, Swiss cheesemakers make Swiss cheese. It's very different in texture and structure. Wow. They have a centerfold. <laughs> it even says so. It says it's a cheese centerfold. How funny is that? Oh my god. So funny. Small world, a rind researcher captures the mic microscopic residents of cheese. It's a close-up of some mold. Wow. Uh, microscope photography. Cheese has, has so much microbial properties. That's what makes it so wonderful. Oh, here, there's a guide here. To the naked eye, the colonies are this size, and it's this white dot, and then it zooms in on the actual, like, mold. You see the white dot? My research is focused on the understanding the various ways in which these microbes interact with each other. Fascinating. From Rachel Dul Dutton, PhD from uh, FAS Center for Systems Biology at Harvard University. Wow. The cheese police. As new food safety laws come to the FDA, cheesemakers best stay clean. Yeah. Betting on bufala. A northern Italian dairy, two brothers make a triumphant transition. Did you know that uh, water buffalo are very temperamental about their milk? Like cows, they give up their milk real fast. 
But uh, water buffalo, um, I used to call them like the divas of the cheese world because they need to be nuzzled or they need to actually be nursing a child to release their milk. So they need to be comforted. It's kind of adorable. Don't we all need to be comforted? <laughs> Petting water buffalo on the snout wasn't on my list of a thousand things to do before I die, but now that I've done it, I'm inclined to boast. <laughs> Very cute. Mmm, buffalo milk, buffalo cheese. Buffala beauties from northern Italy. Blue di buffala, casatica, quadrello, and gran blu. Gran bu. I've only had, I've had all, all I've had three of, of the four of those. Go, uh, buffalo cheeses. I have a book, like an encyclopedia of all the, of most cheeses, and I mark off like the ones that I've had. I don't know, I, I, I love eating cheese. Argentina is a bit wild west, a dab of sophistication, and a whole lot of lineage. Mmm, Argentinian cheese. Oh, at a dairy called La Suerte. So La Suerte means the luck. Oh yeah, Florida Latte Buffalo Mots is great. Great, 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 for sure. I agree. I've had it. Oh, there's like a profile about a cow called a Randall cattle, a Jersey type cow. Look at this illustration of a cow, it's so good. Yes, agreed, cheese achievement unlocked. And then of course, because this is a magazine about cheese, there's uh, a whole bunch of like plates and things that you can get. I sort of stick to my wood and slate. Sculpting cheese is a profession for some, a pastime for anyone. <laughs> oh my god, there's all this advice about carving cheese. It just seems like such a strange, like, country fair thing to do. <laughs> LOL. Visit an art supply store. Choose cheddar. Find a cool location. Begin with a simple shape. Avert typical problems. Well, working in 3D, you suggest working entirely around the cheese instead of focusing on just one area. Otherwise, the work may become too heavily weighted on one side and collapse. I know, cheese carving, this is so funny. Oh, and we're getting to that part the editor mentioned about um, a quick guide to talking cheese. Walk into a well-stocked cheese shop and you enter a linguistic jungle where the names of what you flaunt could be in at least five different languages. As if choosing from the array of cheeses is enough to contend with, how on earth does one pronounce some of the choices? It can be a little inhibiting. So to help avoid miscommunication at the counter, here's a short primer on global cheese speak, one name at a time. Bleu de Auvergne, Cabecou, Chabichou de Poitou, Epoise de Bourgogne, Fleur du Maquis, Garocha, Yet toast. Oh, okay. Yet toast. G J E T O S T is spelled yet. It, it's pronounced yet. Yet toast. So I'll spell it in the chat. G J E T O S T is pronounced yet toast. Yet toast. Idiazabal. Also Erati, yeah, I need that one. Vacheron de Monteau and Valence, yeah. This is the pronouncing world of cheeses. Mm, a person of color! Carlos Sofran, cheesemonger. All right. What is the difference between brie and camembert? To understand the true differences between brie and camembert, both flat, soft discs of white mold-ripened mold cow's milk cheese, one must look to the original recipe. In the case of brie, these include brie de meau and brie de melon. In the case of camembert, camembert de Normandie. Uh, traditional brie is large, flat, la 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 la. Normandie is much smaller, more compact, four to five inches in diameter, and one and a half inches tall. As a result, it matures faster than brie. 
Yeah, so it just outlines the difference between Brie and Tenebra. What a nice surprise. Lovely person of color answering academic questions about cheese. We got ads and ads and ads. They put them all at the end, which I sort of appreciate because it becomes more like a catalog at the end. Um, than it being interrupting, you know, the flow. Like, we haven't really had too many advertisements in this until the end, the very, very end. I would say, well, it seems like it's a lot, a lot of listings of for restaurants and, and businesses. The cheese world's really small. Okay, last page here called Ruminations. And that's, you know why Ruminations is like a perfect title for this? It's a play on words because, um, the thing that curdles milk to make cheese is called rennet. And rennet is found in the fourth stomach of a ruminant animal. So milk making animals, like cows have four stomachs. So the fourth stomach of a ruminant animal <laughs> is how we make cheese. And so rumination for a feature in a cheese magazine is very appropriate. Egg Dawn, it is no coincidence that eggs are found in the dairy aisle. Written, written by Will Fritman. It's possible, even more than cheese, eggs are having their cultural moment. <laughs> Recently, the scientists, my consort, and I attended a talk on home chicken keeping by Susan Orlean, author of The Orchid Thief, who broke a cardinal actor's rule by sharing the stage with a pair of charismatic, misbehaving hens. Mm, okay. I can't resist pointing out the biological similarities between eggs and cheese. Milk and yolk are both high-fat, high-protein infant assembly kits. True. Metabolically expensive to produce and fragile in raw form. They're edible byproducts of reproduction, hijacked by humans for our own purposes. Ah! Eggs, like cheese, also ride the line between a serving as, as a serving as an, and an ingredient. While an egg may be eaten on its own, it works in the background just as often, adding structure to pastry or texture to sauce. Perhaps the ingredientness of both eggs and cheese is why they both found such sublime expression in cuisine, where in regard to raw materials is the rule. Think of the simplicity of the cheese souffle. Wow. Yes. So that was a culture cheese magazine. These are... <laughs> fourth stomach is the dessert stomach. Ha ha. That's great. Um, this is 128 pages. And I don't remember how much it cost. Oh, it was 10 bucks. So this is a hefty, hefty magazine. Mm. All right, so that was Culture Magazine, the word on cheese, spring 2011. We also looked at BTS, aren't that bad. <laughs> I think it's quarterly. I don't know. But they have a lot of great content, obviously. And then... We also looked at Put an Egg on It, Tasty Zine, number 14. BTS, aren't that bad? <laughs> so friends, that was a lot of fun. I'll be back next Sunday to talk about more zines, 12 p.m. Eastern, brunch time. Uh, I'll be back this Wednesday uh, to talk about food and cooking, so get ready for that. Uh, oh. Hello, you made Jesus-shaped pancakes, but you burned them. Are you going to hell? No, you won't. You won't go to hell. How did you make Jesus-shaped pancakes? Do you have a cookie cutter? That's so silly. How do you know it's a Jesus shape? How do you know it's just not a bearded person? <laughs> Anyway, I'm signing off, friends. I'll be back 5 p.m. this Wednesday to talk about food and answer your cooking questions. I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. Uh, I like you. Thanks for hanging out with me. And if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. This is my username, Ranwiches, on Twitter. Um, have a great Sunday. Bye, everybody. Beep.